thank you very much for that, um, Chair, for a very, um, very thoughtful, very deep talk. Um, we'll open it up now to, to questions, but I wanted to um, perhaps sort of kick off the questions with, um, um, as I understand, one of the understandings of Sufism or, or Islam actually is, is that you know, God provides revelation to man, man then corrupts, then God then sends another messenger down, man corrupts, and God sends a prophet out, and that cycle continues. Now, obviously, prophethood has now come to an end. So how, how do you see that cycle being broken? <coughs> I think the Quran is an extraordinary critique of all the ways in which religion degenerates from a certain point of view. It's given us the answers, and um, it is a critique of the way man-made religion slowly replaces divinely revealed religion. So uh, one answer, part of the answer is that the wisdom is in the Quran. Another aspect of the answer, however, is that, speaking from my own experience, I don't think I would have understand much of these things if I hadn't met people who were, in a sense, the living Quran themselves. So we depend on those people who have matured, those people who, have, uh, who are near to God, and that's the meaning of wali, uh, those who are near. That these people um, are examples for us, and through their very state, uh, transmit to us the experience uh, that is at the heart of the revelation. Uh, once a, a prophet was asked, who are the best people? He said, and there are different answers, there are different hadith, but one of the most beautiful ones is, the best human beings are those who, when seen, remind you of God. So we need, uh, we need those who embody this reality. must have to experience the nafs to recognize it within themselves and not just in others to be able to transform to overcome it. All right. So I'll repeat the question. Uh, to what extent do we need to experience our own nafs in order to undergo this transformation that we're talking about? You know, the the approach on one level is just to remind people, to scare them perhaps, to preach to them. This hasn't proved very effective, it seems. Um, but there's a capacity within the human being that allows us to uh, get some distance on our own nafs and maintain, sustain that perspective on the false self. And I'll give some very practical examples of what I'm talking. Let's say that, in essence, what you are is a being that's been invited here by the divine into this beautiful world. And the divine just wants you to be appreciative and grateful and to realize what a gift this is and to remember him, report to him. But however, we all, the ego in all of us, wants attention and doesn't want to be ignored, wants approval and doesn't want to be disapproved, wants to be con in control and not have things out of control and people doing things we don't like. And these are all the games, these are examples of the games that the nafs plays. The fundamental game is that I should be forever undisturbed and anything that disturbs me or becomes difficult in my life is bad. And we get drawn into all those complexes and all those strategies. The strategies include when I face difficulty or things I don't like or people are not behaving the way I want them to behave, we complain or we get angry or we withdraw or we try to control them. 
So these are ra rather, as I'm pointing them out, we will all admit that we all have been guilty of these strategies and these complaints. This is all nos. But what will allow us to see this continually? What will help us to give up the stories we tell about our experience? We write these stories, of stories of dissatisfaction, stories of resentment, or stories of, oh, poor me, or stories that I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. We need and we can, through real spiritual practice, find in ourselves a state of being, a state of well-being that is independent of circumstance. This is the fundamental possibility. And this is faith, this is true faith, this is trust. To know that no matter what happens, we live in a meaningful, purposeful universe, that we are recipients of the divine grace and beneficence, and that everything in our life has been arranged to educate our souls and to remind us of the beauty, generosity, and intelligent nurturance of the divine. When you're in that state, these ego games are a little bit easier to let go of. You see how foolish they are and how they don't bring you what you want anyway. Like, how is, well, is anger working for you, for instance? How, how well is resentment? What's, what's that doing for us? But very often we don't even recognize that we're in a state of resentment. People leave their whole, can live their whole lives in that deepening state of resenting their partner, resenting their job, resenting life or God himself. We need consciousness. That's why we need a higher level of um, presence. Yes. Uh, which again involves, or involves meditation and, and, and Thank you. So the question is about the relationship of modern psychotherapy uh, to Sufism and Sufism to modern psychotherapy and the language that we sometimes use, or it may seem that I use, which may seem to be a bit of a language that at least refers to some of these psychological terms. Well, there's so much that I could say about this. I think there's a big difference between psycho psychology and spirituality. And the, the boundary for me, first of all, is psychology is primarily concerned with me. I mean, I experience this as a, shall we say, a, as a teacher in the spiritual field. That some people come and their total concern is about themselves and their own story. Uh, but then there's a there's a what do you call it? There's a shift. There's a point where, and it's a beautiful point in the journey, when you realize it's really not about you and your story. It's all about God. And that's when we enter the realm of spirituality. We find that Allah is a lot more interesting than my story. But at the same time, we realize that my story, every detail of it, has significance. That the rahmah, the mercy of the divine, is in every detail of the human story. That's the miraculous. I may seem like I'm diverging a little bit, but I'm going to get back to this relationship of psychological language to, uh, let's say, Quranic, the Quranic vocabulary. I believe we need a new way of talking about these things that takes account of some modern, shall we say, uh, uh, awarenesses 
brought by psychology. At the same time, I would never abandon the essential vocabulary of the Quran, which is our key and the most profound terminology. But there are new ways of talking about this truth, the truth revealed in the Quran, without losing, when I say new way, a new way of talking about it, uh, I've written a whole book on Quran, the Quranic vocabulary, so I will stand by it. And in our teaching, we emphasize it. But we also have a new way of talking about these things. For instance, I said in this uh, talk here that the result of spiritual development is a more coherent individual. Now, where's that word from? It's actually from science. And, um, and yet it applies beautifully to our situation, that a strong heart brings coherence to the human being. And to be uh, you know, in a state of less than coherence, uh, dispersion, is an unhappy state. So, Tawheed is the Quranic term. Tawheed is translated all the way from monotheism, which is a very limited understanding of Tawheed, to coherence, which is the unity of existence, the oneness of existence, to uh, another way of understanding it, which is to live on every level of your being simultaneously. So we have ways of talking about the essential truths revealed in the Quran, which for us are a, a beautiful, the Quran is a beautiful vehicle for the understanding and expression of the highest levels of human experience. It has served the greatest mystics of humanity very, very well. But we also are people of this time, and the level of our cultural development is changing. And therefore, we also need to sometimes talk in a new way about these things. A little louder, dear. So the question is, some <coughs> examples of tariqah seem exclusive and are uh, easier for people who have been born into the tradition or the culture to enter. And how can we have a form of Sufism that is more accessible to, to people? Well, this is a very good question and you're pointing to a, you know, a significant need Maybe we need uh, what I sometimes call Sufism 3.0, uh, you know, an upgrade. And, um, and we're working on that. <laughs> and truly, we're working on that. And some of the issues we have to face uh, include, is it possible to create a format in which sincere people can come together, even when there isn't necessarily someone who's matured on the path, in other words, there may not be a sheikh available, can we create a format that would allow people to come together harmoniously without any individual egos taking over and to uh, experience the beauties, the energy, the adab of Sufi culture and to allow their hearts and consciousness to develop. You know, I believe there are some possibilities along those lines. It is a kind of uh, a different approach to Sufism, which I will admit, in many forms, can be quite authoritarian. 
I didn't meet that in my own experience. I've seen it. I've seen plenty of it. But I didn't meet that from my own teachers. My own teachers were true servants. They were humble. Uh, I mean, they were humbler than I could be. And so that's what I hope to learn from them. You know, they were servants, and they were friends. Um, but we, you know, you point to something very good, because many of the forms of Sufism available to us are culturally limited. I mean, some of them are very Turkish, some are very Persian, some are very Arabic. Um, and why can't we have a form of Sufism that is authentic Sufism, true to its you know, uh, DNA, you might say, of, of the true DNA that traces all the way back to the Quran and our Prophet, and yet um, is at home in this culture without compromising with it. So I recognize the need. Yes, you're exactly right. It's, this has been going on for many centuries, and may it continue. It's a living tradition. Thank you. Sufi teaching uh, talks about a person's journey to reform the self. And they talk about states and stations. And a beautiful book by Sheikh Fadlallah Ha'iri on the journey of the self. Uh, also, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Gailani says, you know, it's not, uh, he talks about people as a common man. In Arabic, it's not derogatory or the lay person. And then a khawas, which is a special people, and then khawas for khawas and awliya. So every different single person is a different point in that journey, in this life. Um, so according to a person's position on that journey, you know, so some people complain that X comes to the masjid only on Friday. And I say, alhamdulillah, there are people who don't have, they are born Muslim, they don't follow Islam, they don't believe in Islam, and we are we have different people in different stages. Really the question I would like to ask you and have your opinion, because it really pains me. Uh, when I go to the masjid, I hear things which is said, oh, the Sufis do this, they're all in English, which is say heresy. To me, you know, whatever a person is doing, it's his affair. I mean, obviously, if they come for advice, then, but not to keep going on. Uh, what is your opinion about there is room for everything that is going on? And 
alhamdulillah, in this country, when I look around, there are so many masjids. When I see little children coming into the, our little masjid and learning Quran, I say, alhamdulillah, you know, they are being, I agree, being put in a framework, and it applies to all, you know, other brothers and sisters of other religions and beliefs. So don't you think there is room for both? And that the person would come out of that, if you like, the traditional structure when they are ready into the spiritual side. So the question is, there are different understandings of Islam. Uh, some people in a more conservative mentality, and they may be judging other mentalities, and perhaps the people who are a more less conservative mentality are judging the conservative mentality, and is there room for all? Well, obviously, there's room for all because they're here. And just, just it's, uh, you know, it must be the divine will. And, uh, you know, Allah sometimes even causes our going astray to be the means by which we find our way home. So, and our Prophet peace be upon him, said, you will not enter paradise if there's one atom of pride in your heart. And the person said, well, but, but I like fine clothes, I like to look good. And he said, oh, that's not what I mean by pride. I mean pride is despising others. So, you know, for us, our, the spiritual point of view is not to judge people, not to blame people, but to me, that does not mean not to educate people. It, it does not mean to, to be complacent about the poverty of ideas we see in our society or in a particular religion. You know, I think we need to, I think what people are really lacking uh, very often and is ideas that would enrich their souls because they've never been exposed to those ideas. They're day by day told, you know, well, those people are kafirs, and we have the one true religion. It forms a mentality, it forms a way of thinking. They're not even to blame for that. So it's not a matter of blame, it never is a matter of blaming anyone, but um, we are seekers after truth, and we want to support and um, share the highest truth we know, with those who wish, who are interested in it, not to force it also on others. In Sufism they say, don't wake a sleeping dog. Well, that's a big Tashi saying, it's a bit harsh, but <laughs> you know what I mean. So, so, a question here. So you, you mentioned in your talk about you know, Sufism you know, allows for critical thinking, and I mean, where, where is the with the evidence of that. So in terms of the way that as I understand the structure works, you know, the Prophet, the Sahaba, you have a chain of relations that go down. Yeah. And that's the kind of the master student relationship and eventually the student becomes you know, a master. Yes. You know? But but so where, where does that model allow for you know, challenging and criticizing critical mm. Mm. Yes. Well I was in uh, Sarajevo and I was had had a gathering with a group of people and I invited discussion. And one of the leaders of the community there said, in Bosnia we don't discuss. The sheikh talks, the sheikh talks for 30 years, and then somebody who's listened to him for 30 years becomes the next sheikh. <laughs> and I said, well, that's not how we do it where I'm from. Um, critical thinking uh, is within Sufism. You can find the best critiques of Sufism you can find from within Sufism. Rumi's Mesnavi is full of it. There are lots of funny, hilarious stories about false Sufis and imitators and so forth. So we have within Sufism already a certain critique. But the other, and a, 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 a subtle, nuanced, and deep critique. But the question you raise is also a very valid one. How can we prevent the Sufi educational situation from becoming authoritarian and from turning people into sheep. Uh, I think that depends on the skill of the teacher and 
it's true that we don't find much room for this in the expressions of Sufism I've seen and was brought up in, in the Middle East. But we have certainly tried to uh, encourage dialogue, to make it a dialogic situation. And uh, because I think with our level of cultural development, people need um, to be able to dialogue, to question, to give expression to their own realizations, to be listened to, and also to be commented on. I found myself being invited to some places in Asia and, and, and where I know there are lots of Sufi orders. And I said, well, like in Jakarta, I said, you have lots of Sufis here. Why are you inviting me to come here and talk with you? And they said, well, these were people who are all highly educated. And they said, well, we have sheikhs that are holy, but they have no education. They don't even understand our questions. And uh, I've, I've seen extraordinary examples of, of that. I've asked, seen questions asked on one level get answered on another level. So something's missing. Um, these are you know, valid issues, but no one should be afraid, no teacher should be afraid of being questioned. And, and we're trying to offer a rationale and a reasoned understanding. I think there, this makes sense, you know, uh, the, the realities of, of real spirituality are not about belief, they're about experience. So you offer propositions. The Quran does the same. You don't need to believe the Quran, astaghfirullah, but you take the propositions of the Quran and you verify them for yourselves. Is it true? Indeed, in the remembrance of God, hearts find rest. Is that true or not? Find out for yourself. You know? In the zikr of Allah, hearts find tutmain, you know, restfulness, tranquility. Well, this is a proposition. See if it's true. So you, for example, talk about it partly in jest sufficiently, you talk about Sufism 3.0. Is that more of a flatter structure, less hierarchical, less... Um, it's less... I wouldn't necessarily say it's less hierarchical but it's less hierarchical in the sense that a group of people can come together as equals and with a certain format or protocol under a certain degree of guidance where the values of the tradition are emphasized the values of adab the values of for instance let me give an example when you step across the threshold and we always step over the threshold not on it first lesson you're entering sacred space. This is not a place for your usual chatter and worldly conversation. So there's an adab, there's a courtesy. There's a refinement of attention and presence that happens within that environment. And so you're beginning to live and operate under certain principles and learn certain mastery of attention through certain practices, even a certain way of doing salat which is to do it, um, for example, one day the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was sitting in the mosque in Medina, and a man walked in, and he did his salat, and he got up and he walked past to the Prophet, and, and um, the Prophet said to him, my brother, you have not prayed yet. Go back and pray. So he went back and he did his prostrations again, and he walked past the Prophet, and the Prophet said, Oh, my brother, you still haven't prayed. Go back. He says, By God, you know, I've done it now three times, or whatever. What am I doing wrong? You tell me. He said, All right, my brother, when in each posture that you take, find tranquility in that posture. And when you go into the ruku, find tranquility in your ruku. And don't move the, mur the ruku until you find tranquility. And when you go into sajda, find the tranquility in your sajda. Then you will be praying. Then you, then you will be in ibadah. Otherwise, you're just doing a ritual. And another 
beloved colleague of our, ours, a sheikh, said, for instance, the whole of Islam is in the divine oblivion you experience in the sajda. It's all there. You know? So are you willing to experience that? So there are other ways of learning the value and the depth of these practices. Can you hear? I can't hear. Yeah, walk, come forward. Okay. Um, Sufism is about humility, a humble community, where, in fact, what we're doing is conquering the bad aspects of nafs, the selfishness, and so on. And God being Allah, being omnipotent and omnipresent, can accommodate us all, can accommodate us all. Why do I need a medium? Why do you need a medium? You go to a doctor? Have you ever been to a doctor? No, no, no. The doctor uh, knows this is a slightly different situation. The doctor is supposed to know medicine, which I don't. Here I'm talking about my connection with God, who created me. Mm -hmm. It's a very naive, simple question. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> Why do we need an, why, uh, why do we need a medium? Why does Sufism need a teacher? Because you mentioned that in order for us, you mentioned quotes from the Quran and that we must experience them and then we can verify them through our experience of reading and learning. Mm -hmm. So um, why do we then why does Sufism require the need for a teacher? And the other question I had was can a person become a Sufi without and, and get that Sufism of knowledge without having a teacher. Yes. Well, should I refer to Rumi? I and mean, Rumi says a lot about this. He is a great master. I could just refer to authority and not speak for myself. And r people like Rumi say that having a teacher is absolutely the most important thing. That, that a moment with a God-realized person, and nobody's claiming to be God-realized, okay? But Rumi says this, a moment with a God-realized person is more valuable than 70 years on the prayer mat. That's shocking. It may sound heretical. It may sound blasphemous. But that's what he says. The way I would explain this is very simple. Uh, and thank you for your question. It's probably on many people's minds. Um, I can give lots of reasons, but the first one I'll give is that we are beings, not just of reason, intellect, uh, but we are also beings of vibration. And the support, the love, the friendship of a person of a pure vibration is the most effective way of introducing someone to the reality of those spiritual states. That's the most important reason. All the other reasons actually are secondary. But I'll give you some secondary reasons. Usually the people who least want to submit to a teacher, or shall we say, I'd rather say cooperate with a teacher, because none of my, my teachers ever dominated my life or macro, micromanaged my life. Um, but those who are the most resistant to this idea are usually the ones who need it the most, who lack the humility to learn from another. In any field of knowledge, this humility and learning from another who has mastered your field is common sense. 
So why would we argue with it in the area of spirituality? And a third thing I'll say is that from my own observations, the people who have never had a spiritual, a true spiritual friend, comma guide, comma master, um, are usually people who have not themselves developed the sweetness of devotion that is one of the most beautiful human characteristics that softens people and increases their capacity for love. And I would say the same thing about our relationship, for instance, to our Prophet Muhammad. The people who have a capacity to love him through his beautiful example are the people whose hearts come alive. And if we view it all just intellectually, um, we may be missing something. Now, it's not for anyone to say it's impossible to do it some other way any more than it's impossible for you to win the lottery tomorrow, should you buy lottery tickets, or the spiritual lottery. You could win, maybe there's a spiritual lottery and some people win it. Uh, an example of that, and we allow for that in Sufism. It's called the Uwaisi method, after Uwais Karani of Yemen, who knew the prophet, who reached a very high state without ever meeting him or having a teacher. So we acknowledge this is possible in very, very rare cases. That's the lore of the path. Let's try and take a few more questions with the hand at the back. Yeah, you'll have to shout. <laughs> Yes, so this is a good question. Could we compare the qualities of consciousness within Sufism with other uh, spiritual paths like Buddhism, for instance? And we could also name Advaita Vedanta and contemplative Christianity and, and others. Um, my own journey went through those paths. I studied Buddhism before I knew anything about Islam or Sufism. So I lived that tradition. I studied with a Zen master. Um, when I finally came to Sufism, I encountered not just masters of awareness and masters of will and masters of knowledge, but I encountered masters of love. And that was the real gold for me. That was qualitatively different from everything else I experienced. And in this community, I can freely say that I really believe that the expression of divine rahmat, or the divine mercy, uh, its barakat, comes through the lineage of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his companions and the realized beings that follow truly in their footsteps and truly in their sunnah. And so I, I encountered a degree of love, of overwhelming love, that melted my heart, my mind, and my fair self at least temporarily, um, uh, most powerfully in these inheritors of the Prophet's path. And for me, with Jalaluddin Rumi, but I know there are other greats and many, uh, many branches of this barakah. So I do think there's something special about this. I believe it's integrated with everyday life in a way that few paths are, that it honors human dignity in a way that few paths do, that some of the really Asian traditions of enlightenment actually produce a very abstract kind of enlightenment. What if there are different qualities of enlightenment? Do you want somebody who's so abstracted, so 
cosmic, that, well, we'll stop there. Or do you want somebody, a human being, you can sit down and enjoy a cup of tea with? And that other kind of person, uh, the kind of people that we meet on the Sufi path, they're grounded. They are practical. They don't sacrifice earning a, a livelihood and having a family if it's their destiny. Uh, they attain the highest states of realization in the midst of everyday life, doing ordinary things, without in the least uh, reducing that attainment. In fact, in my mind, it's a superior attainment. If your enlightenment prevents you from having a job, it's not a mature enlightenment, in my opinion. Um, so some of the greatest Sufis are invisible. They're in everyday life. They don't look special. Um, this is the integration of Sufism. But most of all, I would say, there is this profound, beautiful uh, sense of tenderness and love that comes through. It is the divine mercy that was transmitted through our beloved prophet and the Quran. And that's why uh, I'm concerned when I see it turned into a religion of fear. That's why I feel the situation is urgent. And it's not a matter of blaming any person uh, or feeling superior to anyone. It's a matter of making the reality of this Rachna present. Um, so we have just a few more minutes, am I right? Yeah, yeah. Until 8.30, is that the plan? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. Okay, we'll take uh, maybe one or two more questions and then we'll put over to uh, questions here. Yeah. Um, essentially, uh, you might sound a bit wrong, hopefully it doesn't. Essentially, To look at the which side? The four mother. Or the four seven. Yeah. Should we take a few questions actually? Just to work for it. Okay. I wanted to leave some time for. Someone asked if I would do a little bit of a kind of musical zikr with a saz oh, okay. for a few minutes. Okay, sure. I just want to leave five minutes for that. Sure, okay. 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 Sounds good. Okay, we'll take, okay, we'll take you as the last question then. Yeah. What was the question? If I was to seek a student-master relationship, how does one go about doing that? Oh, I don't know how one seeks a master-student relationship. Trust in God and uh, let all your needs be known to Allah and your needs will surely be granted. That's the basic answer. And as for the uh, madabs, um, I don't have a lot to say about that. Um, I would I would prefer and I've learned to trust the friends of God the awliya as my source of inspiration uh, society needs law the madabs are for that and that's all I really want to say. But some friends had asked, it wasn't my idea, but some friends had asked if I would share with you a little bit of a sort of melodic zikr that we sometimes do, which may be something new for many of you. And uh, Sadat, do you have an instrument here? Where is Sadat? Could you bring an instrument and hopefully it's in tune? Zeliha, could you come up here and... And this is just the Kalima Tawheed, and may I borrow this? Um, you could just open it up for me. And um, Charlie, is Charlie here? With a, a bandier?
you sit here. Okay. okay. I didn't want the um, set up the stage, which is just nothing. Okay. Can I just briefly just formally thank the chef um, for his thank presentation? Thank you. For thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you to have the microphone nice and close to you. Zeliha came from Holland for this event. We're delighted she's here. She has a beautiful voice. We're going to leave you with an azan so that when you leave and perhaps you go home or go somewhere and find a place for your Isha prayer, you will have heard your, this azan. Allah, I 